old people. Mm. 
May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word and may it sink deep down within our hearts. As you take your seat, I just want to use for a subject on today the cost of being a Christian. The cost of being a Christian. It was on January the 19th, 2015, a Friday, I received a call from my mother as I passed the Philadelphia airport on my way to Richmond, Virginia, as a midler at the Samuel D. Witt School of Theology. She said, Chandra, you need to come home as the nurse is here, and she said that your father is making his transition. As I drove, I prayed that the Lord would keep my father alive until I returned back to my parents' home. This time was only one of the two times, and the other time was just recently, January the 28th, where my son was shot. It was one of the longest 15-minute drives in my life. Mm. I didn't quite know how this transition thing worked. Would my father last an hour? Would he last two hours, 24 hours, or even a couple days? My father got through Friday, and now it was Saturday. Reverend Kwan, this day would be difficult for me as I had just put together the First Pennsylvania Baptist State Convention Preaching Institute. It was my baby. I had handpicked all the pastors that would teach personally, and I needed to be there. On Saturday morning at 7 a.m., after consulting God and my mother, I left the house to coordinate and spend the day learning preaching from some of Philadelphia's finest, such as Bishop Keith Reed, Pastor Alan Waller, and Pastor J. Lewis Felton. Over 75 preachers showed up that morning, and it was both an impactful and historical moment for me. I had to be in attendance. But it was at this aha moment that I understood that the call on my life was larger than what was going on back at the house with my father. Yes, my brothers and sisters, I had discovered that there will be times in ministry, times in our lives as, as Christians, that we will have to make very difficult decisions in our lives. But that's when God will reassure us. Mm. That answering the call and serving in ministry has rewards and has benefits. It's here in our text this morning, lest I bore you, that we are at the last of four scenes after Jesus foretells of his death for a second time that illustrates the disciples' lack of understanding. If we were to go back just a few verses in this chapter, we find these jokers, I mean we find these disciples arguing and fussing over which one of them would get the most likes on Facebook, which one of them would get the most followers on Instagram, which one of them would get the most views on Snapchat. I mean they were arguing about who would be the most famous. But then we see John trying to get brownie points by telling Jesus, Jesus, I saw a man in the Target parking lot. He was laying hands and casting out demons in the name of you. So we walked up to him and we said, listen, sir, you are not a part of the disciple squad. So you got to stop. Jesus says, don't stop him because if he's not hurting my name, then he's helping me. Mm. Then Jesus and his disciples get to a Samaritan village and get to the Ritz Carlton. But when the Samaritans find out that they are going to Jerusalem, they tell them there are no more room and we are sold out. And so when Jesus gets back to the camel, John and James find out that the front desk is playing games. So they ask Jesus, listen, Jesus, do you want us to go to the back of the building and set it on fire with them inside? They tell Jesus, just give us the word. Jesus says, nope, they're not worth it. We'll take our business elsewhere. And it is here now that we find ourselves in this text as they are walking. Here's the first thing that we see in our text. We see one disciple makes a promise. Look at somebody next to you and tell them he makes a promise. He says, I'll go with you wherever. And I don't know about you, but there have been some people in my life that have made some promises to me without knowing the cost. And as soon as I told them the cost, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy, but there are friends that have promised you some stuff, but when the rubber met the road, they backed out when they found out the price that they would have to pay as a friend. So 
Jesus says, yeah, disciples, that sounds good in theory, but not in practice. Because when you make this type of statement, you are saying to yourself and you are saying to me that you are willing to sacrifice it all. Jesus goes on to say, I've already told you in a few verses back, in verses 22 and verses 44, that rejection and, follow, and, and hate followed me. He lets them know that I was, he, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, he says, I will be, I was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. He tells the disciples that you, you have to know that because people are going to hate on us, there will be no open doors of opportunity. We won't sleep in the best places. We won't eat at the best rock, restaurant. As a matter of fact, if we get a bed in the Motel 6, we'll be doing good. <laughs> if we eat Vienna sausages and peanut butter crackers from the dollar store, mm. we'll be doing good. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I have discovered some times in my life that serving Jesus does not always give me a front seat at the place. Right. I wish I could get some help. You might not be left at your job because you claim the name of Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of our jobs have proselyting rules. You can't even speak the name of Jesus. But I know there's two people like me that when I think of the goodness of Jesus and everything that he's done for me, sometimes even if I gotta run to the bathroom, even if I gotta go to the parking lot, sometimes I just gotta give him a praise. Following 
you, but I just can't start the day. <laughs> <laughs>